PVL2602 case summaries, page 23. Back versus Master of the Supreme Court. Application in terms of Section 23 of the Wills Act for the acceptance of a document as a will. Notes only. Before a court can make an order in terms of Section 23 of the Wills Act, that a document or amendment to a document which does not comply with all the formalities of the Wills Act can be accepted as valid. There are requirements to be met. A document or amendment must have been drafted or executed by a person who has since died and who intended the document to be his or her will. A wide discretion is therefore conferred upon the courts to decide a case on its own facts and circumstances. This principle can perhaps best be illustrated by comparing the facts of ex parte Maurice and the back case. The Maurice case the deceased instructed a person to drop his will. These instructions still had to be knocked into shape and approved by the testator. These instructions could therefore not have been intended by the deceased to be his will. In the back case, on the other hand, the deceased had already approved the final draft it, if therefore easy, it is therefore easy to understand that the court held that the intended document to be his will. So to repeat, back versus master of the Supreme Court. Application in terms of section 2 verse, subsection 3 of the Wills Act for the acceptance of a document as a will. Before a court can make an order in terms of Section 2.3 of the Wills Act that a document or amendment to a document which does not comply with all the formalities of the Wills Act can be accepted as valid, there are requirements to be met. The document or amendment must have been drafted or executed by a person who has since died and who intended the document to be his or her will. That is back versus master of the Supreme Court. Moses versus Abin. Abinada, Moses versus Abinada, revival of a revoked will. The testator executed a will on the 6th of August 1948 in which he appointed his two stepbrothers as his sole heirs. On the 12th of August 1948, he executed a second will which revoked the first. In terms of the second will, Mrs. Moses, the appellant, was appointed heiress to half his estate, while his stepbrothers were to receive the remaining half. On advice of a friend who did not know of the second will, the testator subsequently varied clause 4 of his first will in a codicil to the first will. A disagreement arose between Mrs. Moses and one of the stepbrothers, the respondent, as to the whether the provisions of the codicil of the first will precedence, took precedence over those of the second will. The court, our quo, held that the first will, as revised by the codicil, was effective as the deceased's last testamentary disposition and that of the second will, in so far as it conflicted the first 
was invalid. However, the appellate division held that effect should be given to the second will and the codicil. However, the appellate division held that effect should be given to the second will and the codicil. Marie versus the master. This is to do with revocation by destruction of a copy of a will. The testator was divorced from his wife in 1972 and his will was executed in 1977. He bequeathed his entire estate to his divorced wife. The testator was only in possession of a copy of his will which was sent by him to his attorneys bound within a cover and accompanied by a letter referring to the original will which was in custody of the attorneys. Copy was unsigned. It was otherwise a replica of the original will. Before his death, the testator attempted to revoke his will by writing words on all the documents, the cover, the will and the letter indicating that he wished to revoke his will. On cover, he wrote that his mother should inherit his property. These directions did not amount to a will because the formalities of the execution of a will were not complied with. If the testator's will was considered to be revoked, then his estate would devolve intestate and his three children would inherit inherit the estate. The master rejected the original will and the former wife of the testator sought an order declaring the will valid. The court held that the will had been validly revoked. In terms of section 2a of the Wills Act, a court is satisfied that a testator intended to revoke his or her will or part thereof by means of written indication on the will or performed any other act to the will which is apparent on the face of the will or if such intention appears from another document, the court must declare the will or part concerned revoked. And that is Marais versus the master. Fun sale versus fun sale. Presumption against fidei commissary substation. Repeat. Fun sale versus fun sale. The presumption against a fidei commissary substation. Correction, substitution. Under a mutual will, the testator and his wife bequeathed a portion of a farm to each of their children. And should a child predecease to his or her lawful descendants. All the bequests to the children were subject to a, a usufruct in favor of the surviving spouse and b a provision that in the event of a legatee dying without leaving children then the land left to such legatee should revert in equal shares to the other living legatees or their descendants by representation. One son, F. W. Foncel, died without leaving children. The surviving children to the testator applied for an order declaring that the portion of the farm bequeathed to F. W. Foncel did not form part of the joint estate of the said F. W. Foncel and his surviving spouse 
but that they, as the surviving legatees, were entitled to it. F. W. Fonsell's widow was the first respondent in her capacity of executor in his estate and second respondent in her personal capacity. The question for decision was whether Clause B quoted above constituted a direct or fide commissary substitution. The applicants contended that the provision constituted a fide commissum in their favour. They were unsuccessful in the court a quo. The decision was then reversed in the appellate division. Ex parte Steenkamp and Steenkamp Capacity of a murderer to inherit from the heir of the murdered person. The testator bequeathed a farm and certain movables to their grandchildren. These children's father was Steenkamp, then murdered both the testators. He was then convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. One of the grandchildren died and Steenkamp and his wife applied into Alia for an order declaring that they were the sole heirs of the deceased child. The master raised the question whether Steenkamp could inherit anything out of the estate of his child which had come from the grandparents' estate as he had murdered them. The court held that he was not worthy to inherit from the child. It is not general unworthiness to inherit which attaches to a murdered or a murderer. As is evident from this case, a person may, for example, be unworthy to inherit from one person but may still be able to inherit from another for example the heir of the murdered person in the Steenkamp case the court found that there was no causal relationship between the murderer and the enrichment but that the cause of Steenkamp's enrichment was the birth and death of the child and not the murder. So the court held that Steenkamp was not unworthy to inherit from the child. That's ex parte Steenkamp and Steenkamp. Spies versus Smith. Testamentary capacity. Undue influencing of a testator. The testator was mentally handicapped and also suffered from epilepsy. At the age of 21, he made a will in which he appointed the two daughters of his stepmother, the appellant, as heirs. After his father's death, he went to live with his uncle, who was curator bonus, as the rest of the family wanted to have him committed to an institution. Thereafter, he made a second will revoking the first and appointing his uncle's children, the first respondent, as beneficiaries. After his death, approximately 10 years later, his stepmother contested the validity of the second will on behalf of her minor daughter. She contended that the testator had not been mentally capable when he made the second will. In the alternative, she contested that the uncle had unduly influenced him. The court held that the second will was valid and an appeal against the decision was dismissed. In our law, there is a rebuttable presumption that a testamentary writing was executed by a competent testator and that it reflects 
the testator's intention. Consequently, a person who alleges that a will was executed as a result of undue influence will have to prove that is the case. Repeat, in our law, there is a rebuttable presumption that a testamentary writing was executed by a competent testator and that it reflects the testator's intention. Consequently, a person who alleges that a will was executed as a result of undue influence will have to prove that is the case. That is Spiss versus Smith in testamentary capacity undue influencing of a testator. Aronson versus Estate Heart Condition in a will compelling a beneficiary to marry a Jew. Condition in a will compelling a beneficiary to marry a Jew. This is Aronson versus Estate Heart. The testator will contained a condition providing for a forfeiture of a beneficiary of all benefits bequeathed to such beneficiary under the will if he or she should marry a person not born in the Jewish faith or forsake the Jewish faith. One of the beneficiaries under the will applied for an order declaring the condition to be void. The application was dismissed by the court a quo and an appeal against this decision was unsuccessful. There can therefore be no doubt that a clause in a will providing that a beneficiary will forfeit a benefit should he or she marry a person of a certain race or faith in principle is valid. Barclays Bank DC and O versus Anderson Condition in a will with regard to the disruption of an existing marriage. Condition in a will with regard to the disruption of an existing marriage. A testator left certain provisions of a farm, portions of a farm to his children. In clause 12b of the will, it was provided that every beneficiary shall personally, permanently and beneficially occupy the land bequeathed to him or her. In clause 12c, it was provided that, it, that should a beneficiary fail to occupy his land, he or she would lose all rights and claims to his or her portion of the farm. It's Barclays Bank versus O, uh, Barclays Bank and O versus Anderson. The importance of Road versus Stubbs. Road versus Stubbs. This is on page 28 of the summary. According to our common law rules of interpretation, when interpreting a joint or mutual will of parties married in community of property, one has to start off on the premise that one is dealing with two separate wills of the parties until a contrary becomes clear. This rule results from the common law rule that no one can deprive himself of the power to freely make a last will. A testator can, by means of massing, deprive himself of his power to make a will. But if there is any uncertainty about his intention, the will should be interpreted in a manner that will allow the greatest possible measure of freedom of testation. This rule results from the common law rule that no one can deprive himself of the power to freely make a last will. The, the, the test, a testator can, by means of massing, deprive himself of his power to make a will. But if there is any uncertainty about his intention, 
the will should be interpreted in a manner that will allow the greatest possible measure of the freedom of testation. This gives rise to the subsidiary rule of interpretation, namely the presumption against massing, which applies when the golden rule of interpretation, namely to give meaning to the testator's words within the framework of the will, cannot be applied because the words are unclear or subject to more than one interpretation. For massing to take place, it is necessary for one testator to dispose of both his estate or part thereof and the estate or part thereof of the testator. Repeat, for massing to take place, it is necessary for one testator to dispose of both his own estate or part thereof and the estate or part thereof of the other testator.